Uh, hello to everyone. My name is Carolina and I'm from Boulder. Welcome to our webinar on how to accelerate digitization of products and services in your company. This webinar will be hosted in a form of a conversation between representatives of two companies, namely Zonen and Boulder. In the discussion, we'll explore a real life case study of how Zonen approached a digital transformation and how Boulder helped along the way. However, before we dig in, a few words of introduction. This webinar is hosted by Boulder. Uh, we are a digital product design and development company with over 15 years of experience. 140 employees, over 250 web and mobile applications developed, and 100 clients in our roster. We help companies big and small build digital products and go through a process of digital transformation to prepare them for the future. You will hear more about specifics of our approach during today's session. Uh, and if you're curious, you can find out more about us on our website, boulder.com. And also, we encourage you to sign up to our next webinar on how to become an agile company. My colleague will post the link to the session in the chat, so please sign up today. The webinar will be a follow-up to today's session and will focus on the business benefits of agile and the path of agile implementation. Now, let me introduce you to today's speakers. Uh, we welcome Michael Konder, Vice President of Digital Solutions at Zonen, and Artur Belka, Customer Success at Boulder. If at any point you have any questions to our speakers, please do not hesitate to post them in the questions tab on your right-hand side. Uh, during the webinar, Artur will pick the questions and answer them together with Michael. We will not host a dedicated Q&A session after the webinar, so please make sure to type in those questions as soon as they come up. Uh, so if you feel like posting your question in public is not something you prefer, you can always contact us uh, via email. It's hello at boulder.com. Now let's welcome Arthur and Michal. Guys, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carolina. Thanks for Thank your you. very kind introduction and uh, very good to see you. Very good to see you, uh, Michel. And uh, guys, just a few words of introduction. Uh, let me tell you something more about uh, who Michel is. Uh, that guy is the Vice President of uh, Digital Solutions at, uh, at Zonon. That is true. Uh, but uh, Michel, please uh, tell a few words or maybe correct me. You have an extensive experience in both product management, but also in the energy and utilities market. Because before that, you actually worked at the SWM company at Munich, who essentially delivers energy to the uh, city services of the city of Munich in Bavaria. And before that, uh, you also were highly engaged in energy business as a product manager and as an innovation uh, manager. So uh, you have an extensive background in that. Uh, when we are talking about questions, guys, please feel very open to type them. If we don't get the chance to answer them, please be sure that we'll reach out to you. Uh, so no question will be lost whether or not we have the time to answer that. And I <laughs> try to make sure that uh, there is, it's there. So, uh, uh, Michael, if you could uh, confirm or possibly disapprove what I what I told you about you and uh, how connected you are to what digital transformation is. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Arthur. I think uh, the, for a quick introduction, that was uh, pr pretty right. Yeah, um, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm really driven by by, by two things. Uh, probably my whole professional career and even even before is really uh, renewable energies. So how can you transform energy markets to something more um, yeah, renewable, more sustainable, um, probably also more democratic uh, if, if you want to, uh, and also digital. So I'm, uh, originally I, I started, um, I, I studied um, computer science uh, focused but also focus a lot on other things. So not only what is happening inside uh, the computer, but also what is happening outside. So how can you transform um, organizations? How can we transform um, uh, the way people c collaborate, uh, 
uh, how can you transform businesses um, with uh, doing software and with doing hardware. Um, so I also studied a lot of in uh, psychology, um, a bit of politics, a uh, bit of uh, economics and so on. So to really get the, the whole picture, um, I was uh, in the early um, um, on zero years, so 2000, 2003, I think, um, where I think the whole thing like digitalization uh, wasn't really on the table as a name, but I, I was focused on on what you probably now would uh, call digitization. And um, yeah, in my whole professional career, I really was focusing on how can you transform organizations and especially how can you transform markets. Um, and uh, I really love renewable energy. Uh, so it's a perfect place to be for me. Um, and yeah, I think for a rough start point, <laughs> probably you can now understand what, what's driving me at least. And I was always at the edge of uh, yeah the industry and, and the digital part of it and always uh, trying to, to really transform things. Yeah, it's a, it's a great introduction. And uh, now you are at Zonon, uh, partnering with us in digital transformation, working on various projects. But before we jump into what the digital transformation really is, how we understand it, what components there are of it, and how the, the story went in uh, in Zonon. Uh, let's tell our guests about what Zonon really is and what you guys do. Uh, I can I can just paint that in, in some very rough shape. So basically, you're a green energy company. Uh, if any of you guys want to install solar panels on your rooftop, you will need a, a, a battery to store that energy because the sun doesn't shine at night and also it doesn't shine the same way every day. So you need a storage facility. But besides from that, you need a connection to the national power grid and you need quite a lot of complex systems in order to calculate your taxes, calculate the way that you sell your energy, that you receive it and so on. And uh, that battery, that infrastructure is what you guys basically do in Germany, various other European countries, but also to a very large extent in the in, in the US. Am, am I right in sketching that roughly? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> could could phrase it better. Uh, and I think if if you want to understand what what is our approach to to digital transformation, it's also probably interesting how Zon started um, because the company is only ten years old, um, which is quite young. Uh, you could still call us a startup but i think that's not true anymore but really started like uh, two guys more or less in a garage um building up one of the first um, um pv storage batteries in the world um and then bringing that to the market growing and growing and growing um but really started with hardware yeah so zonen didn't start as any software tech company but really hardware metal uh, electricity <laughs> battery, lithium, iron, phosphate, all these, these, these crazy things. Um, and uh, now we are, um, I think, active yeah, in a lot of markets you mentioned. Also in Australia, we are quite quite big um, market leader, innovation leader with uh, more than 700 employees and uh, a lot more than 100 million revenue uh, in, in 2020, I think, at least if the year doesn't crash <laughs> in the, in the last, <laughs> last two or three weeks. Um, so there's, there's a massive growth uh, that was happening in the last years. Um, and um, this, is, um, this is really what, what makes uh, Zonen uh, interesting because we are in many areas innovation leader, at least I would call us like, something like this. Um, we are market leaders and probably we are always very, very fast with things we do. Um, and that's also what when we come to digital transformation was, was driving us like the last probably five years to uh, become more and more a software company, more and more digital company, um, and and uh, where hardware is the key. Yeah, it's very it's very cool if you have hardware in someone's household. Yeah, because sure. hardware doesn't move away. <laughs> but if you then create a big digital ecosystem around it, then you can really uh, boost your product services and also your your um, connections to your customers. And that was things that were driving on uh, among the last years, I think. Uh, that is very cool, and that I think it's a good segue to uh, to what digital transformation is. You started as a as an engineering company, basically dealing mostly in hardware, and uh, we get a very very good question from Pavel. Uh, 
what were the first signs that is on the needs a digital transformation? We can jump into what we understand by digital transformation later on, but uh, if you could speak from your from your memories, when possibly you you thought that you might need some support from that, or just things had to change a bit in order to adjust or to move or to change. Mm -hmm. I think there were, were probably two bigger drivers. Yeah, the one was um, uh, was really scaling. Yeah, so um, we had some pretty good products and, and services that were selling quite well. Customers were quite happy with that. Um, but it's a difference if you sell, I don't know, 50 or 100 units uh, per month, or if you sell 2,000, 5,000 per month. Um, that was the first thing. We discovered that if we combine more things to the to the hardware, um, it might be of much higher value to our customers. Uh, and that's why we decided to become more like a, a full service energy supplier. Yeah? So uh, you, you, in the introduction, you mentioned uh, the sun doesn't always shine. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. And in uh, winter days like, like this, at least here in Germany at the moment, we don't have that much sun over days. Um, and then even your battery is empty. So you need energy from somewhere else. Yeah. And that's where we're on and start. Okay. We don't want our customers to have. Um, uh, a battery from Zonen and a PV system from someone else and then an energy contract from a third party and, and so on and so on so that uh, customers have a lot of complexity um, because the complexity is only fun for, for people who really like to get deeply into it. But if you want to make energy revolution a product for everybody, um, you need to make it simple. Yeah? So that was the one driver, um, getting everything from one hand as a full service energy provider. And the second bigger driver was that our current business model, um, which is quite successful, but still is relying on a lot of um, third party um, contractors. So uh, meaning if we want to get our hardware to, to our customers, it's mostly sold by third parties and it's installed by third parties. Um, so we are in a in a B2B to C business model for, for most of the parts. And um, it's very, very hard to have um, a constant quality in this business. Yeah? The end customer perceives Zonen. They see Zonen, yeah? they open our app, they see our hardware, everything is, is branded with Zonen, but it comes from a lot of different uh, companies uh, all over the planet yeah? so that deliver it to the customer. And we saw that the quality issues were in, in all directions. People were st um, telling sales stories <laughs> that weren't just true. Yeah? So we thought, okay, we need to get more control of this B2B to C approach. Yeah? So we need to be in more control about what happens at the end customer, what is told to them, what is sold to them, what is installed to them, how are they serviced, um, so that the whole story and the whole perception of our products is, is in a way that, that we think it should be. Um, and again, if you want to include several hundreds of thousands of parties worldwide, it's hard to do that via telephone. Yeah? So digital might be an approach to, to get to this. Yeah, yeah I think that uh, what you told uh, us just, just now is a great illustration of how we can think about digital transformation. Because you can, you can understand it in, in its simplest. It's just perhaps moving from analog processes to digital processes in a simple way or perhaps in some other take, just adding new technological features that are digital. But that's not really about that. What you really mentioned is about uh, transitioning the, the very core of your service and changing it in improving customer experience across many channels in changing it completely. Also shifting the business model and the revenue model. So it's a very important thing. And also it's about optimizing internal operations and also supply chains, partners, and so on. So it's really an encompassing thing. And I uh, I would say that it's, it's a great illustration of what uh, a very systemic digital transformation is, touching upon ev almost every component of what the company, what the company does. Uh, and it's usually composed of several things. So you need a strategy and a goal and a vision to do that. Uh, you need to change some roles and some structures, and you also need to think about people, the skill, the way they are organized. So if we if we jump to the strategy 
and what, what drove you. We've been cooperating for quite a long time and it's it changed quite a bit because definitely we can see that there was a goal uh, and some decision making was implemented in new ways. Now it's much more data driven uh, based on metrics, on tools, on tools like uh, customer journey mapping, innovation workshops, setting goals in a data driven way. Uh, I think that changed massively. Uh, what do you think was most important here in just setting these goals in choosing tools of how to steer transformation? Mm, I, I think it, it really, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not a very good statement, but it really starts with a vision. Yeah, it's, uh, that, that's so important and um, really is, is driving us um, all the way uh, since, since several years. If you have a really good vision and if you have people who can tell that vision and carry it to other people, um, that's probably the, the most most binding thing you can have. Yeah. So um, what we wanted to achieve, and I think that's, that's very important when you talk about digital transformation, it, for me, it always comes with agile transformation. Yeah. The, those are two, two sides of the same coin because digital transformation is um, can be also can be even disruptive. Yeah, you can disrupt your own business model, other people's business model, um, but at least it uh, is a good answer to, to complexity and uh, how to remain fast, how to remain innovative, how to always improve. Um, yeah, but it in the end, it's an answer to complexity. And uh, I think the more you come to digital, the more the classical hierarchical models come to the end yeah so it's you have so many dependencies so many complexities that probably um ev not everything can be decided uh, going up the the hier hierarchy ladder um but you need to have decisions more and more where people are really in contact with um, customers in contact with customer journey in contact with data in contact with services uh, so that they can decide more and more autonomously and um but if everybody is deciding what they want, <laughs> then probably you, you get you get a total mess. So the vision is really something that 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 can bind everything together um, and derive from this a good strategy. And um, we at Zona, we took we took quite some time for defining this 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 strategy, not to every single piece and bit, but we said, okay, what do what kind of approach do we want to take? How um, what do we want to, to achieve with it? And at the end, we really decided for several more disruptive approaches. Um, and we, we formed teams um, that were able to, to really do disruption, um, but then changed the teams quite fast again so that it gets more sustainable. Yeah, Because disrupting something is like <laughs> the big bang. Yeah. Um, and you introduce new things and everything is cool and funny and hoo hoo hoo. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, but then it, you need to make it well yeah and this this these are changes in the skill sets you need these are changes in the technology you need yeah you need to uh, combine innovation and being fast with being sustainable being stable and and all these these aspects um and this was pretty clear for us from the start that we will always need to change yeah there's there's this big vision there's the, the strategy but Underneath all the teams, the team structures, the skill sets, the technology, everything is due to, to constant change. And we, we try to form something that is um, supporting this. Yeah. So uh, we didn't have like a three years plan <laughs> with uh, several hundreds of pages, um, but at least some rough points need, need to be absolutely clear that we wanted to go that way. Yeah, right. And that's a, that's the essence of, a, of an agile approach, right? So you have the, the strategy, you have the vision. And what strategy really is, uh, well, at least as uh, most people would define it, is just uh, milestones, the actions that have to be done on, in general terms, just put in time. But how exactly it's going to be executed is, uh, is down to details. And Agile helps in that enormously. You mentioned, you know, uh, about teams reformulation and responding quickly to changing needs and also incremental approach in changing. So yeah, disruptive, but it's, it's being revised all the time. And this is something that I remember very clearly. There's such changes in, uh, in team structure being done really when it is, uh, it is necessary. So uh, it is a very agile approach. And, uh, but implementing agile was not that easy. It, it, it didn't come you know, uh, without its pains. Uh, 
uh, it also took some time. So uh, what do you think was the biggest challenge here in introducing this uh, very, uh, very IT world, not so much hardware uh, world approach into Zonon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, like probably with all transformations, the, the first big challenge was that we didn't start Greenfield. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you could just take a book and uh, and uh, read the pages and just do it. So, uh, a lot was already there. Yeah. So when we really started uh, the larger transformation, we were already what you at least. To, to a certain extent could call digital here. Yeah. We already had like an app and customer portal. We had a lot of things connected. We had um, a big CRM systems. So we, we, we were not a hardware company working with paper. Uh, there was already a lot of things there. Um, but the biggest challenges we had was um, we grew very fast. So the team grew from probably 20, 25 to more than 100 within several months. So it was very fast growth. Um, we had to divide in a lot of teams. Uh, so first we were probably two or three uh, teams working more or less agile. And then we extended that to uh, 10 plus teams. Um, and that's cool, but everybody needs still to work on the same on the same goal. Yeah. And if you if you think about what Agile gives you, they, Agile talks a lot about how teams uh, work inside, yeah? how they focus on a certain um, product, on a certain service, uh, and how, how the team processes are, the culture, the communication, how you deliver good software. Um, but it's harder if, if you have a lot of teams, and this uh, lot of teams is, all, or is also included in an even larger company. So how do you align the company strategy, the company's roadmaps to uh, an overall digital roadmap, how to come to um, team roadmaps that the teams know where to go. Um, and also from a technical perspective, how do you align architecture? Yeah? If you want more or less autonomous teams making autonomous decisions, um, that probably shouldn't uh, result in an architecture, the one going this technology, the other this technology, one going with that API uh, <laughs> version, the others. Uh, uh, creating a lot of dependencies that no one um, is caring about. So th these are the nitty and gritty parts that you really need, need to look at then. Um, and that gave us a lot of a lot of headache. Yeah. So because what, what happens if if you from a more central or from, from more management perspective say, we want to have this kind of architecture. We want these services to communicate that way. We want this kind of product. We want these kinds of features. Then you get a top-down approach again. Then then everybody in, in the then existing or uh, creating hierarchy is coming to you and asking you questions. And they say, hey, should I do it that way or that way? Yeah, And that's not what we wanted. We want uh, teams that are fully responsible for a certain product or for at least parts of a product or a, or a customer journey and that they can make decisions um, as fast as they can. Yeah, Because if you can make fast decisions, you as a business get fast. So getting this getting a good mixture between what we need to define on a on a more um, central level yeah, and what we probably need to do a bit top down and what we allow as, as freedom in, in the teams. That was one of the, and, and is still the, the biggest challenge probably. Yeah? Um, and, um, but that's also very good because if you get there and you get teams that really feel fully responsible for something and you have good people in those teams, then they, really get running yeah then you can see excellent results you can see people having fun on, on their job and and customers being happy because they can use greater tools because someone really emphasized on this and if you on the other hand do too much top down um everything gets slower and quality decreases you probably don't have that many hassle and not that many uh discussions among teams you need to to facilitate um but definitely you're slower and, and not not that cool. Yeah, yeah and uh, I think that by that you answered very well uh, another question that Pavel just asked, which oh. was which were the which were the biggest obstacles in the in the process, and uh, that is exactly that. But we get another one from Mohammed, and it is uh, how do we deal with uh, unmatured organizations uh, employees? It was one of my barriers during some projects I've been involved in. 
I think that uh, what Muhammad has in his mind is uh, how to approach basically onboarding people into uh, into an agile, into a, a lean organization. And it, uh, in my experience, it, uh, it does take time sometimes. It also uh, takes a hiring strategy uh, because sadly not everybody will be ready to work in such an environment. Uh, but how, how, how do you see that, Mark, Michel? Absolutely. I think there, there are two aspects. One is uh, if you need new people on board, yes, it, a good hiring strategy is, is very important. Um, but I think as I understand Mohamed's question also, if uh, employees that are already there and that are probably not used to an, to an agile way of working and to more decentralized decision making, um, and and that can be, and is probably one of one of the toughest um, uh, problems you might face, yeah, because not everybody is really willing to take that way. It's not only that they are not used to, and sometimes you really come to a point where you say, hmm, probably it, it doesn't really work, yeah, um, and uh, that's that's the same we we had at Zonen and also with my, my previous employee employers. Um, you you get to to that point and. Um, you can. There's there are a lot of ways how you can uh, try to encourage people. Yeah, how to how you get step by step to to a certain point, and I think it's most important that you that two of the of the if you look at Scrum for example, if, if two of the roles are uh, well chosen. Yeah, if the product owner and the Scrum master are not hierarchical but more encouraging the team and uh top product owner that is that is more like a visionary a guy and, and and really dragging people uh to to certain directions saying hey this is so cool and thank you and we we need that and on the other hand uh, a scrum master uh, or agile coach really looking at at the uh, team structures at every individual in the teams and how they behave. Um, that, that's very important and that, that's a good start. And what we then um, uh, put aside on this were, were coaching programs so that if you see someone has some problems with it, how can we do, um, increase that with personal coaching, um, giving, showing them some paths, showing, you know, probably different team setups, different roles, trying do, different things. Um, because you cannot force people to be agile, yeah, but you can try to to show them different perspectives, and quite often that matches. Then they find a, a slot where they say, "Okay, this is now cool." And then from from us, from management perspective, it was our job to make it happen. Yeah. So if if you find a, um, a good job for for someone who's already there since several years and says, and this person says, "Okay, this is where I want to commit." Yeah. Then we need to make it happen. Yeah. But at a certain point, some probably that, that doesn't really work out. Um, and then we also need, need to talk about, okay, is, is this really a good fit or what can we do? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, sir. And I think that that point also might come up when it, uh, you know, when we are talking about cooperation between two companies. Uh, because what you mentioned was basically uh, that you need to give the people the feeling of security and empowerment and impact of an understanding of what they are actually doing. And that happens when the teams are reasonably flat. Uh, that also comes to roles like scrum masters and product masters, so that uh, product uh, product owner, so that everybody actually feels, you know, like a team member. Uh, our team members are very multidisciplinary, right? They consist of designers, front end developers, uh, DevOps, scrum masters, back end developers. So they are multidisciplinary. We take great care so that everybody feels a full-fledged team member. Uh, but there also is the structure of uh, standards and design sprints and alignments. Uh, so yeah, there are many tools and many practices that we can we can use uh, to to do that. But working on equal footing between companies is also important. So I think that uh, one of points of success that we actually performed during our cooperation was that uh, people feel extremely equal as uh, members of two different companies but working in single teams in uh, combined teams and working on the same project very openly communicating very freely and uh, I think that we, we can be really proud of that yeah I, 
I, I fully agree. I think this, this we had, we had, from that perspective, we had two things that we thought from the beginning were very important. The one is we knew um, we wouldn't hire any, everybody as an internal um, uh, because that would just take too long and also wouldn't give us the flexibility because we didn't know the exact path. Yeah, So um, we, we always wanted to have flexibility and, and great skills. So we said, we want some, some good um, partners um, external companies yeah but we want to treat them as internals yeah we want we want teams just to be teams and not care about from which company you come yeah you, everybody is responsible for for a product or for a service or for a great experience and uh, the combination of who uh, from uh, has a contract with Zonin or with with Boulder or with some other companies that shouldn't care. Yeah? So we we treated everybody more or less like like the same. Yeah, uh, resulting of course that you as company have to be open. Yeah, so uh, you cannot you shouldn't have too many secrets. Yeah, uh, because it, it always feels like not not at uh, at arm length um, and on the same level. Um, that was the one thing. And the second thing um, I would like to add is uh, we also said we don't want something like, like a more classical um, IT and, and business um, uh, approach. So um, uh, having an IT department, having business departments, and the business departments tell what they want, and the IT department has to deliver it. Yeah, Because it, that's also quite common common approach where you can, you can be very successful. But we wanted to get, get one step further and we said, okay, the teams we are forming, they are really responsible for the product and not for the digital part of the product. So they are really responsible for the whole product. And that means they are also responsible uh, to for service, for example. Yeah, We said, okay, if the customer has a problem, um, he will call our number. And okay, if in the first step, he will get to, to our hotline. But if he really has a problem, then the telephone within your team will ring. Right. There, is, there is no line of defense, yeah. So you have to deal with, with those customers, and you have two two ways: either you take the phone or email, um, or you deliver um, software that um, prevents the customer to call. Yeah, you have, you have all skills on board, um, and you're responsible for. It. And that that was also, um, uh, I think, for us also a bit revolutionary, and and um, it, but resulted in people really 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 feeling responsible for what they do yeah um it, it's a difference if you have to talk to a customer directly or if uh the, your service department tells you okay we have 200 service cases for this uh, special part of of the product and someone needs to uh, do something tell us yeah and then the service department calls all the customers again <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. yeah and that that was that it, that's still one one approach i really love um and those two two combinations of uh don't care about who's internal and external and the other thing don't care about whose business and IT, um, we are all one and we are all together responsible for a good result. Um, um, I think that was from a cultural perspective one of the, the major changes um, and and brought us very far. Yeah, yeah when you are ma uh, making that point, it, um, it, it, it also brought me back to this question of Mohammed, of how you how you actually may make people more aligned or more mature. If you give somebody responsibility, they will often uh, just grow up to it automatically, if, if, if they really do, because uh, you might be a bit afraid of something, you may not be really understanding the impact of what you are doing, and thus not really committing yourself. But when you actually see the results of your work, positive or negative, uh, that, will, that will impact on you. And uh, I think that's a very important point of how we try to work as well. Uh, as uh, as partners, really, and and here another another thing came to my mind because digital transformation in most cases doesn't really touch the entire company in the same way, and uh, every department in the same way. And uh, I think that uh, Zonin is quite a specific case uh, because you are member of what is sometimes called uh, Mittelstand companies in Germany. So these are medium-sized companies with some strong regional ties, usually very innovative, uh, with a long-term focus and defined business strategy, uh, laser focused, uh, doing one thing extremely well, and that is your product and your services. Uh, but these companies, 
are also are, are almost never publicly owned, and they might have a very traditional structure of management. So there is this uh, reporting structure, which sometimes doesn't really change much during the during operations or digital transformation. And there is the digital services and the actual product changes. So what I'd like to highlight is that you don't actually need to revolutionize the entire company if you manage it well. I think that uh, you know. Uh, it, it would not be realistic. Sometimes it would be against culture, not really necessary, because you have to be respectful of where you are working and what you what others are doing, right? So uh, when I am thinking about uh, how zone and change, it comes to my mind. So, uh, uh, and, and that is also a good lesson. So you can be cherry picking sometimes. You can you can select to change some parts of the company in a way that would be beneficial for you. But things that work fine can be kept sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that, that that that's true, and that exactly our our approach. Um, I mean, everybody, every company has has to find uh, their own approach. What is what is good for them, and and how how it works. And uh, we exactly said we we don't need to transform the whole company. Yeah, and it doesn't. If if you look at our let's say traditional and, and bread and butter um, hardware business, which is very, very high um, high level engineering. Yeah. You don't, you sh and it works well. Uh, why do you take, why take different approaches? Yeah. If, if it's good. Um, and if you're talking about a business where you have innovation cycles of between nine and, and uh, 18 months, or probably even 24 months, um, you can work with other development models. Yeah, um, if you, if you talk about hardware, all the certifications you need in order to get connections to the energy grid, and we all need that. But probably you, you don't have to, uh, to to fully transform that. You can also improve it sometimes. Yeah, but um, the area we were approaching was really really customer focusing, really market focusing, really focusing on growth, on, on, on scaling, and also focusing on competition. Yeah, we, we always wanted to get ahead of competition. We saw that in our industry, um, where we're talking about um, electricians, for example, yeah, so um, in, in German, it's uh, it's Handwerk. Yeah, I, I don't know yeah. the, the English word for it. Yeah, um, this is sometimes not really digitized, yeah, um, but if you really understand that part of the business and, and you think it in a digital way, um, you see, okay, wow, there's, there's a lot of room for improvement uh, that can be also fun for our partners, yeah? Where they say, okay, wow, this is so cool. I can sell more in less time and I can install more in less time so I can make better business, yeah? Um, and if you, if you get your partners to that point, yeah, with digital, then, then it's cool, yeah? If you just do digital because you want to, and if you just uh, add, do agile because you want to, then at the end probably you, you produce a big heap of software <laughs> and and a very cool company, but nothing really changes uh, with impact to the outside world. Uh, and I think this is this is probably then the, um, the thing where, where you can measure success or not. Does it really have impact on the outside world? Yeah, it does it. Do you get more customers? Do you get happier customers? Do we reduce costs? Um, is it easier to partner with new companies? Is it uh, easier to bundle your products with other products and services? Can you extend to new markets uh, faster than, than than previously? If you if you look at the, this kind of impact, then you see okay, th this is something where digital and, and agile can help you. If you don't see this this impact coming, then probably business is already fine and we probably don't don't have to touch it for the next one, two or three years. Um, and the other thing you mentioned, I think is very important is being respectful. Yeah. And this was also something I, I always, not, not only at Zon, but also in, in all previous companies I, I saw is um, if you want to do new things, going new ways um, that might also appear a bit arrogant. Yeah. So, because you, you say, I know it better. Yeah, there's, there's, there's this better approach. Yeah, uh, and the, not everybody is happy <laughs> if you tell them, okay, you, you worked a certain way for 10 years and now we do it uh, because I know how to do it. Um, and that, that's not what you, what you should do, but really convincing people. Yeah, um, I mean, it's just saying winning hearts and minds. Haha. Yeah, but that, that's really about that, that's really what, what, it, what it's about. Um, 
and if you do that and and uh, be respectful for what is what is there and uh, the the achievements and try to include that to, to a certain way then then you are probably much more successful than um uh telling everybody you're the smartest guy in in, in the room yeah yeah true uh you may you, you you may know that you you know the best and you very well may know the best but if you can't actually put that into practice and uh, pull others on board it's just not effective so uh it, it doesn't really matter and the the way you do that is being respectful being respectful to business partners being respectful for people who, with whom you work but it's also about transparency and openness and communicating the actual the actual gain why we should do that that way why we should take this decision in that way because right now we are data driven we have metrics we have tools we are mapping the customer experience we are mapping the business model we are doing these innovation workshops and all of that and that also drives motivation in teams i think if people really understand what's actually going on not just being told that is the goal and that is the way we are going to do that but actually being being involved and uh, the tools here are, are numerous right in uh, product development uh, in mapping customer journey in adjusting goals to that uh, metrics tools we, we introduced quite a lot of that during our, our work what do you think was the most challenging here uh, from from that point of view when it comes to the tools and metrics that we are using to to take decisions actually mm -hmm. um <laughs> really getting to the tools and metrics <laughs> so, and really? to, to, to be to be helpful it's, it's still what, something what do, you mean, what do you mean what do you mean by getting to them yeah uh, so it's a, because it's, it's it's still something we are we're working on yeah i mean we want to be data driven but if i'm very honest we we are not in all areas we are not that data driven as we want to be yeah because sometimes it's really hard to gather all the data um because and I think this is quite typical, not only for for, for Zonin and uh, but also for a lot of other companies I know, because also with with data you have legacy, yeah, and you have probably you have legacy systems, you have legacy processes, um, and what we saw is that probably some years ago, yeah, data and good data quality wasn't that valuable yeah or people didn't see, didn't sometimes see the value uh, you just need to get your process running yeah and <laughs> what you do is ah, okay it does work so i added some uh, some fields here and there and and now it works and okay i can write my bill and my, my invoice it's good but if you later want to to come to uh really good data quality where you can have a clear picture of what's happening outside what's happening in the market what is happening in your processes um, what is happening with customer satisfaction and you want to make decisions based on this um, you get right really run into trouble <laughs> if the data quality isn't that good or if you don't know exactly how to what what's the correct interpretation of what you see yeah um, so this this is um, from from not only tool question is really a, a mindset quiz um, question um where why is good data quality so important yeah um and this is something we are we are still discussing and, and driving in 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 the whole company um that everybody is responsible for good data quality because that's the the easiest way how we can uh, have a clear picture on what's happening and how we can clearly identify where we can improve where we have new business chances um and and this is this is a lot of work yeah because getting a data-driven mindset uh in in an organization and this is not only in the parts but you need to get it in more or less all parts of the organization um this is uh just quite a lot of thing quite a lot of discussions quite a lot of analysis um really dragging out what are the root causes for some uh data quality issues closing some some process gaps this is really nitty and gritty sometimes um but but so important um and um yeah that that's probably one of the the, the most important things yeah um and and when i come to f tools yeah um and and uh, things I think what we see at the moment with uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, situation, I would call it here. Um, so people working from home, you sitting at home, me sitting at home, probably some of our uh, guests are, are sitting at home and, and listening. Um, this is, 
I think this was very cool that we started um, as a remote team from the beginning. Yeah, so we have people uh, with Boulder in, in, in yeah. Poland, and we have people in Germany in, in several uh, offices of, of, of Sonnen, and the whole collaboration was already quite, quite digital and doing design sprints, um, doing concepts, all remotely connected uh, with uh, with uh, tools like like Flat. Slack and uh, Google Suite, Miro as a, as a big whiteboard, uh, and then applying the, the right um, methodologies on, on this, um, that really boosted us. Yeah, it took a bit from in, in the first, I don't know, weeks and months, because not everybody's used to, to this kind of, of collaboration. But I think this is one of the things where we uh, were, where the, the change of uh, with COVID-19 for us was more or less seamless. Yeah, we just, Moved everybody moved to home office and <laughs> continued the way we worked before. Um, so it was, uh, I think, it was from from the whole business perspective helping us a lot, and also from a cultural perspective, um, it, it wasn't that major change. Yeah, so we knew how to collaborate and communicate on, on a digital, digital way, and um, that that's probably one of the biggest benefits, even if it's not really product related. But the whole culture uh, enabled us to to do it then. Yeah, it's it's something they also noticed. Uh, so uh, basically, the way that we cooperate didn't really change much. Of course, uh, before this uh, global sanitary fiasco, we were trying to have some more face-to-face -face and physical contact, like uh, meeting at least once every few weeks, once every every month, uh, either here in Poland or uh, over there at your uh, HQ in, in Germany right now. We obviously had to limit that. I hope we'll come back to that when this, we know that passes. But yeah, uh, there really wasn't much change. And uh, that's also telling. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, it's not the, even that I'm, I'm thinking that it's, it's, it's an obvious fact that uh, this, this COVID-19 thing sped up things at companies at an incredible rate. So uh, it, it, it was a digital transformation at its simplest at many companies and, uh, and introduced forcibly just because of these, uh, these events of uh, almost the entire last year, I, I would say. Hmm. And we were quite happy uh, and, and lucky that we actually were ready for that and, didn't, and much didn't really, really, ch really change from that mm -hmm. effect. Yeah, and and I mean, you were, were just talking about you know, we were talking about tools and and those things, and this is, I mean, it it really helped us that we did uh, introduce our, for example, our architecture teams uh, in a fully remote setup in a fully digital setup before uh, we went into the pandemic, yeah, um, because this, these are very complex discussions, also design discussions about uh, first on a high level, what, what is the customer journey, which uh, kind of customer experience do we want to have, where and then dragging it down to, to, to design. This, this works perfectly if you sit next to each other, yeah, when, when you can, can draw things and uh, if you want to, to build, uh, to draw a bigger architecture and, and have in-depth discussion about certain areas and how APIs should, should um, uh, communicate uh, among each other. Um, and we are quite used to doing this on, on a wall like this, yeah. <laughs> but as we already started doing it uh, in a, with, with digital tools, um, it, it wasn't a big change, yeah. So it, that really helped us that we transformed a lot of uh, methodologies that that you normally would do with uh, with post-its and with whiteboards, and transformed all of this um, to to digital way uh, before. Um, so we just could continue. Um, and if I now look back, I would never change it back again, yeah, because it's it's so much easier um, to to look things up to continue work if you have the the right tools in, in place and a right kind of facilitation moderation uh methodologies you use and and and, and a tool set from how you want to work with, with each other um that's at the end it, it turned out to to be much faster than than doing it um, with the more uh, offline approaches we, we had previously yeah. so um this is really one of the 
biggest biggest benefits from collaboration. And this will, I think, drag us uh, <laughs> for for ages now. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is very interesting because uh, obviously, if you want to collaborate uh, in an agile way with uh, and have the full benefit of of teamwork and all of that, you will need facilitation and you will need these tools that help you extract, uh, you know the right ideas and to validate them during workshops, for example, during design sessions, all of that. Yeah, you need the tools and and, uh, and the roles. But uh, do you think that would be difficult to transition back to uh, to doing that in a room, uh, sitting physically at the table? Yeah. Um, I, I think I, I recognize several uh, workshops do, during the summer um, where we were sitting in one room, so where we did have that that contact restrictions from because of, of COVID, um, but we were all sitting in one room in front of our laptops with our, <laughs> our headsets on it. We were working in the uh, uh, online collaboration tools. Yeah, we, had, we had one on 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 the big screen, yeah, so that we can everybody look at the same thing. What you normally would do in, in the screen share or something, but the rest we were all uh, taking digital tools because we saw okay, this is much more natural for us uh, already. Yeah. Bit strange if you <laughs> yeah. people are sitting next to each other, uh, but it was really like working was was this and having fun. Of course, you turned next to, uh, to the next uh, colleague and and um, yeah, had had some some jokes and so on. Yeah, uh, uh, there is no coming back. You know, uh, <laughs> really yeah. interesting. Uh, I think that we, we we could speak a bit about uh, product management. And how that changed during the uh, the last, let's say, two years that we were working together. Uh, obviously, you were managing and working a lot on uh, on innovation at uh, at Zonen and at, at project management at uh, at digital utility department, right? Uh, there was a lot of development, a lot a lot changed here. We produced a lot of products and, and services and a lot of transformation. Uh, could you comment on that a bit? How that, uh, you know, uh, product management practices change when you were enabled and empowered with more data, with new tools, new team setups, uh, and, and all of that? Mm -hmm. um, I think we, from, from very beginning when we started we had part of the vision was um, we wanted to become more not only more data driven but also more API driven um, we wanted to transform our business to apis which is really a hard job <laughs> yeah um, and in in the beginning it, it it didn't turn out that that we were able to to do this transformation just in one step yeah so it, it to, we need to take a, a lot of uh, steps in between. We need to learn. Uh, needed to learn a lot. Um, we also, I mean, you don't do an API just because an API is cool, yeah. Uh, but you want because you want to do something with it. And one of the major uh, drivers for us was that we wanted to uh, combine and, and bundle our business with um, external partners, so with other businesses. Yeah. If if we wanted to approach new markets where we probably don't have our full um, service portfolio active yeah but only parts of it and wanted to to uh, bundle that with other companies that provided the other part but still one big customer experience and one big like and i think this this is the major change in in, in product management um not think about your product as as a silo yeah as something that is there that customers can buy pay for and be happy uh, but as something that is consists of many smaller services uh, which part parts of it can come from you as a company, but also can come from others. And how do you make the best bundles for for the for the customer? Yeah. Um, so not think about we deliver everything, um, but we are part of a bigger ecosystem. Yeah. Um, so product management and this is still under a transformation and transformation and transformation is becoming more and more like an ecosystem management um, where you see us providing things um, and others providing things. And at the end, there's always this one customer of us. It's, it's residential customers, people in their households, where we want to give the best experience about 
energy, about um, EV driving, um, so everything that is done with electricity. Um, and and it's not always Sonnen. Yeah? It cannot always be Sonnen because then we would be, I don't know, a triple billion uh, company. Um, so <laughs> Someday. Someday, yeah. Probably 2022. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. It's a little strategy, right? Yeah. So th this this is the change, um, and the, if you think that to the end, then it's again it's it's not software, it's everything. Yeah, how how do you uh, do contracts with with customers if you are only part of the service? Yeah, um, how do you do change uh, other parts of the service from that are coming from from third parties? Um, how do you um, get to get to some API lifecycle management? Yeah, so you have services in place uh, that are that have an API that is uh, one and a half years old, uh, and a lot of other customer experiences are uh, relying on this. But from in, from your perspective, you need to change it, and it's very important that you do this bigger changes. And how do you get to good con uh, API contracts and uh, good API management? And and this is this is really the the change that is currently going on um, and will, I think, continue in, in, in a very fast way. Um, and yeah, this this is, I, I don't know if, if you still can call it product management, it's it's, it's really changing to, to more ecosystem approach. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it's probably very true. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are we, we are closing in our time now. Uh, we actually have just a few, but uh, perhaps there is something we haven't really touched on that you think is important or you'd like to say. So uh, what haven't we talked about you think might be worth just mentioning? Mm. Not, I think we, we already talked about it, but I think from, from, from my perspective, um, it's really everything you do in, in those those larger transformations. Um, I think for me, it's, it's very important to always look at, at the people um, and and at the culture. And this is not because uh, you, you just say those things and uh, uh, they, they're important, um, but it's really, if, if you can get your culture to um, people and teams encouraging, taking their own decisions, um, this is this is largest step yeah this is not what every body is, is just able to do from okay previously i was the boss of uh, 25 people and i told them what to do and now i'm more like the moderator facilitator someone who creates structures that that people can more or less decide on their own what to do um this is a big change on, on a management perspective and also on an employee perspective it's it's a change you, you have much more freedom but much more responsibility, um, and this is not what everybody is uh, is used to. But if you come to a combination where, where the culture, the management um, philosophy, and the the uh, employees' um, skill set and, and characters, if, if those things match, yeah, um, then it really gets to something greater. Yeah, if the, the things don't match and you just want to transform the things with, uh, okay, we need to apply this methodologies we need to apply these processes and then everything will be agile and great yeah? um this this very likely to well not to be that good at least yeah not not probably won't fail but uh will we not that you lose, you lose a lot so um i think this is always the the very important thing there, there can be good bus business strategies good great it architect architectures that can be a great people to deliver great software but if that not all matches in one culture um then it's getting rather slower than than faster and and worse yeah? so um and it's a lot of fun if it works <laughs> yeah it does yeah. Uh, so, thank you michael and uh it, it, it was great having you today uh, I guess we'll, we'll be talking uh, privately on some everyday business very, uh, very soon. And uh, uh, Pavel, I can see your question, but let's uh, take that uh, outside. I, I try to uh, try to answer that with, with with Michael. I want to be respectful of your of your time, guys. And uh, Carolina, step on with some with some closing remarks. The, the voice is yours. Sure. Thank you so much for uh, being with us here. Thank you for your attention and a special thanks to uh, Michael and Arthur for uh, sharing your expertise and knowledge. Uh, also, I wanted to say that we all do realize that 
every path of every company is different and requires such a custom approach to digitization of products and services. And we would be delighted to talk to you how Boulder can help on your path. Uh, our, our experts here at Boulder can help you structure uh, and fully support you along the way. So don't hesitate to get in touch with us via hello at boulder.com. Also, we have uh, one uh, more request. Basically, we would love to get in touch with you to get uh, feedback about today's session, but also ask you additional questions and insights, challenges that you might be facing in your company in order to prepare even more valuable content and webinars in the future. So my colleague Jan will be in touch with you shortly to ask about your insights. And on the final note, uh, we hope we can see you once again at our forthcoming webinar. We touched today upon the topic of agile company and how to become one. But uh, in the next session in January, we'll share much more insights about how to implement it in your business. So thank you so much for your attention and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, guys, and stay safe. Thank you.